The story of the war, the story of poverty, and the story of Africa. I belong to all of those. My name is Leonard Bagalwa, and I am originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo. When I was kidnapped, I was forced to join the military. I was brainwashed over there. I was very small a kid and I, I couldn't uh, shoot, I didn't, I hate guns and uh, that's the most things I hate in my life. Normally people who were opposing in that refugee camp, they were killed. Instead of training me as a military man, they trained me as a spy. After six months, uh, they decided to take us back home to go fight. I went to the other side of the water, uh, to the dock. I had a strong voice telling me, run, Leonard, run. I end by uh, going to the bush where I met a pygmies. Pygmies told me how to get back home. It took me four days to go back home, walking night and day. So when I went home, I knock on the door, um, tell my mom to uh, open for me. My mom opened and when she saw me, she thought she saw a demon. She uh, decided to lock, to close the door on me and I keep knocking. She opened again three times, uh, knocking and, then she, and I told her, that's me, your son. When she opened, she told me I cannot stay there. I asked her why. She told me, your two brothers right now are in the morgue. They were, they were shot yesterday, they were killed. So those rebels came here looking for you. And I don't want, I don't want to see anything like that. You have to leave. And I told my mom, I'm not going anywhere. I work for four days to come home. I'm not going anywhere. Let me die here as well. And my mom went in her room and she came up with her wrapper and she uh, said, let's go. And we don't know, I don't know where we are going. So we entered the, the Catholic Church. When they saw me, they didn't ask me any questions. They were like, we already know your story. Uh, you are all over the news. So a few minutes later on, they put me in the back of their car, and we went, I found myself where in Uvira, in the eastern side of Congo. A priest took me to the uh, Lake Tanganyika. We put, uh, put us in the boat, and they ship us to Tanzania, and that's how I escaped. This, these things happened in a matter of hours. It's something that wasn't planned ahead, but God um, inspired people of how to help me, and that's how I left Congo. When we went to Tanzania, they already organized somebody uh, with a, a, a taxi to take us to uh, the capital city. So we stayed in the hotel. After two days, the hotel manager came and um, said, your money is finished. So when we left, the priest gave, gave me a uh, hundred dollars. We decided to go to the um, refugee camp in, in Malawi. So I'm talking about we here because I was with the other guy. We met in Uvira, Catholic uh, priest who were trying to smuggle out too, who had the same problem, he was a, a student, and his name was Christian. When we went to the border of Malawi, we didn't have passport. And going over there, we met two guys, and those guys, they really, they beat us. They just jumped on us and started beating us and tear off all the clothes we had. And so a few minutes later, I told Christian, I feel I feel that we're going to die. And if we're going to die, 
it's better to die close to the road so that somebody can see our body. If we die here, then nobody will bury us. So Christian said, uh, I am not going with you because your decision is putting me in trouble. So I'm not going with you. I'm going to stay here. I'm like, okay. So I left. I went to, back to the road. I felt a strong spirit. Keep telling me, Leonard, go get Christian. Go get Christian. So I went back. I told Christian, we need to go. We need to get out of here. And with my strong voice, Christian decided to follow me. When we went back to the road, like within a minute, we saw a white car just come, come the other side. So I had to raise my hand. I'm like, uh, and the guy pulled over and started looking at us. Like, okay, so who are you? Are you human or animals? And I yelled, we are human in Swahili. We are human. So what he said was, poor my brother's Tanzanian. That's what he said in Swahili. I didn't understand. I didn't know what he meant by that. And he asked me, like, how can I help? And I told him the best way to help is to let us know where we can go. And he's like, I know where the refugee camp is in Malawi. So he took us to Malawi refugee camp after three hours of driving. So he gave us some clothes and he gave me a Bible. And that's the time he told me he was a pastor. So he left me up over there in the refugee camp in Malawi. In the refugee camp, life wasn't easy. When people hear about refugee camp, they think it's just a house. They don't understand what it means. There's a difference between refugees in the first world countries and in the third world countries. Malawi is the poorest country in the world. One day, I was walking like 6 a.m. I just had my, I just had a voice calling me, Mirindi, not Leonard, Mirindi. And I'm like, who the heck knows me here? Who knows me by that name, except my mother? I saw like a little, little guy came, he's like, Mirindi, you don't remember me? My name is Pascal. And I'm like, no, I don't remember. He's like, when we were a refugee from Rwanda, your mom came in the refugee camp and took us and took us from the refugee camp and took you to your house. And I'm like, no, you guys died in 1996 when, um, when they, they came to, f to, to destroy the refugee camp. It's so like, no, we survived. We all are alive. And my father want to see you. And I'm like, how did your father know I'm here? He's like, my father is in charge of this refugee camp. So he took me to his home. I met his father. Yes, I didn't know the child, but I remember the father. And the father told me two things. I can help you the way you want. I can get you a job, or I can get you out of this refugee camp. And I'm like, please get me out of this refugee camp. I was born a Christian. I was always praying to get help. And that's how he ended by helping me get out of the refugee camp. After I arrived here in the United States, the hard things was the culture. So imagine from the third world country to the village to the first world country in a town, big city like Solid City. I 
I did not know English. I did not learn English in school. So in the Provo area, that's where I got a job at uh, Provo Symmetry. And my shift was at midnight. And I asked my supervisor, why can't we do this any other time? He said, no, he was from Brazil. It was a cleaning company. And uh, he said, no, that's the shift we have. If you want it, take it or not. So anyway, I take it because I didn't have choice. And um, I was paid $7 at the time. Sometimes when you kneel down, you're going to take the dead flower, the dry flower out of the grave. I will feel like something is pulling my hair back, which even I don't even have hair. I will feel like somebody's pulling it because I'm scared. I had to call this guy from Kenya like every night, like if you don't hear my voice, please call 911. So when I quit my job, I, I ended by being homeless and I was homeless at Provo Library. So after a week, I heard a strong voice, Leonard, this is not what brought you to America. You can do better than this. You need to ask help. If you don't ask, no one will help you. You need to ask for help. On Saturday morning at 6 a.m., I woke up with my staff just walking around. Around 7 or 7 ish, I saw somebody uh, pull the car in the back of the library. I saw like one couple come out of the car and I follow, I keep yelling, I need help, I need help. And the wife heard me um, yell. And then he, she, can, she yelled to her husband like, Doug, can't we help this young man? So I said, I am homeless. I'm a refugee from Congo and I'm, I'm homeless. And he's like, oh yeah, we have met a lot of people from Congo. We served a mission in, uh, in South Africa. We can help, but we are in hurry right now. Here's my business card. I didn't have a phone to call them on Sunday. And on Monday, I went to the library and asked the phone. I called them like, oh yeah, we were thinking about you. Can you come live with us? I'm like, yes. So I went to live with them in South Jordan. Over there, I learned how to milk cows and because they were farmers and uh, um, I learned how to do a lot of things. And after a year, I moved again back to uh, Orom. So one day they come to visit me, they brought me a check of $10,000 and a car. And I told them I don't want the money. He paid all my tuition for five years and asked him, I'm now done with school, what can I do to pay you back? That's what I told him and he's like, I know what you can pay me back. Go out over there and help other people. Who are those people I'm going to help? I don't know them. So I come home, I prayed, and I felt good to look a job into the refugee organization. And the first job I applied is the same job I'm still on today. I work with a small company called Health Access Project. We partner with the Department of Workforce Service to provide health care to refugees. We partner with Intermountain, Partner with university or hospital. Doing case management for refugees over there, I found out that the same problem I had when I came in this country is still the same problem refugees are having. Refugees' needs are just small education, helping them, like teaching them how to do things on their own, not giving them free stuff, showing them how to take a bus, showing them how you do your doctor's appointment, how you do your job interview, how, how you can you keep your job. How do you talk to people like English, ABC? Those are the things refugees need. So I decided like, I'm gonna use my personal experience to help other people. I started putting all the legal paper together and today we have an organization 
called Utah Valley Refugees. We have been able to help more than 100 families. And among those 100 families, five families already bought a home. Refugees are people who they need uh, motivation. The best way to help people is to be their friend. Because when you are my friend, you're close to me. And when you're close to me, you're gonna know me, how to help me better. You might think money is what they need, but the reality, they need some other guidance. And that guidance you give them can change their lives. Nothing is impossible. Everything is possible if you believe it and you can do it. Life is not hard here compared to the refugee camp. If you made it from the refugee camp, you can make it here. I have been seeing refugees who, who are doing good as long as they are oriented at first. I lost two brothers and that it makes me sad every time. Um, the other thing is home is home. Home is home, I miss it. Even if the situation we were living, even if we were poor, the condition I was living in, I still miss it. I feel blessed um, and I feel, I feel successful. And I call myself the best, the most successful refugees in this country. Um, I, I came here like 15, 16 years ago. I own a home, okay? I have a good job. I have a, um, a family. I have a degree. With all these things happened to me, I did nothing special. I did not, I'm not different than all those people who work hard and be successful. My name is uh, Leonard Bagalua and this is my story.